what does that mean? You know, there's a lot of really nice hype, really nice talk about that. But first of all, what does it mean? Secondly, is there any real payoff? And that's exactly what we're going to dive into today. I'm Ravi Tangri, and I'm here with my dear friend Martin across the pond in Austria. Uh, I'm, I'm from Canada. And what we're going to get into today is we are going to get into looking at why do we want to inspire organizations? That, does it make a difference? Does it really have anything more than fluff to it? And that's what we would get want to get down to. Then Martin will be introducing uh, the five steps that he finds powerful in in using this to to be able to create inspired organizations. And then I'll be bringing in a systems approach that I use that's actually very aligned with Martin's approach. And uh, so that's what we're we're going to be getting into uh, the, this next little bit. If you've got questions, if you've got concerns, please uh, jot them in. We can respond to them, put them in the comments, and we can uh, absolutely uh, respond to these. So hi, Martin. How are you doing, sir? I'm fabulous. Thank you, Ravi. What a joy to be here. So this is this is interesting. We started doing these lives a few weeks ago on more personal matters, but now we're taking it into the corporate arena where I think it's just, just as relevant. I mean, people talk about having a work life and a home life, but you don't. You just got one life, and, and it, it really all does connect, does it not? Absolutely, it does. Yeah, so let's dive into this. Uh, if if we, we we get into the, the, this whole issue of, you know, why are we even talking about inspired organizations? And um, it sells a lot of books. It does this, but does it really make a difference? What's what's your take on that? Well, I think, especially as the times are changing now. Uh, we are living in an environment, and especially with the young people now coming into the workforce, they are not prone or they're not, well, let's say the, the old uh, chain of command thinking isn't in their liking. Yeah. What we see more and more now when we talk to the young people, uh, it's they are driven by purpose. And if we look at the word inspiration, then it has inspirare, and so from the Latin, it's uh, uh, forgive me, my, my Latin is, is basically non-existing, but better the, than mine. If we if we look at the if we look at the root of it, then there is in spirit, if you will, right? So there is something that that inspires us, and not for nothing, you also call if you think about it, you call alcoholics spirits. So this is another form of, of um, where, where you have a, a material spirit. So what, if you drink alcohol, and I'm not proposing that, but if, if you drink, then people get less inhibited. They become more forward. They, they are more frank with their opinions. And in today's workforce, these are actually qualities that we can achieve without alcohol because it has several drawbacks and side effects that we don't want to have. But what we do want to have now in a world that gets more and more complex, we want a people who are driven from the inside out. We want a people who think on them on their own, uh, who are not just waiting for somebody giving them a command, but what we want to do, if we really want to get results, then we have to have people that are, that are really inspired as, as, as the word suggests. And, so we want people who take initiative on their own uh, and, and who think and who realize, who are able to analyze a problem. Because if we are waiting for the instructions to come from above in these fast times, the opportunity or the threat, even worse, will have already passed and taken effect before somebody uh, reacts to it. So what we need now in order to really produce results is because A of the times that we are in, we need people who are really on target, on purpose, who are really committed. And on the other hand, the, the young people that are coming into the workforce now, they are not interested in the old model anymore. They want to have something that, that fulfills their 
desire to make an impact, th their desire yeah. to, to serve a purpose, to, to do something that is useful, that will benefit uh, the, the world and which is tying into their intrinsic motivation. And we will talk maybe about this a little bit later, why we need intrinsic instead of extrinsic motivation. Well, so this, these are just yeah. some thoughts on, on this topic. Well, yes. yes. And the thing is, it's it's interesting because now we're moving into this world where there's a whole lot more. Um, a lot of the baby boomers are starting to retire. And the, the other thing is there's a huge amount of disengagement. We talk about engagement. I don't know if you're in Europe, you use this term, but in North America, there's an epidemic of what's called presenteeism where um, absenteeism was you were, where you're actually absent and presenteeism, you're at your desk, but hello, nobody's home, right? <laughs> so you've got like zero productivity. Yeah. And so this is really rampant across North America. And it's, it's a lot of people have been beaten down too much and it's possibly the opposite of inspired organizations. And you're exactly. right that younger generations are looking for meaning and purpose. And I think they get a lot of bad rap that they won't work hard. They absolutely will work hard if absolutely. it has meaning for them. They won't just exactly. do it because they're told to like we boomers were, right? Yeah, totally agree. And, and it's, even, it's even worse in Europe. Okay, it is. Wow, that's interesting because I would not have thought so. All right, that's scary. Uh, so the, the thing is too, that boomers, when they realize that, oh my God, I can actually have a job where I enjoy what I'm doing uh, and look forward to it, that it's, thank God it's Monday instead of dreading Monday. Uh, th they go, yeah, well, of course I would take that. And the, the funny thing is a lot of boomers are retiring and they're now in retirement, they're still relatively young and they're following their passions and they're starting to have that sort of engagement in stuff that they wish they'd always done. And yet they never did it all of their work careers. You know, it's, it's they're, they're realizing, oh my God, work can be inspiring and joyful. And for me, culture, the, what we're talking about culture, which is just the way you do stuff, right? In an organization, 70% of culture is shaped by leadership. And, Absolutely. you know, it, in terms of does it make a difference? Well, the, I, I'm still a scientist in many ways. And I, I like to look at data. And there's a, a really amazing study that Dennis Kravetz did um, where he tracked for organizations for 10 years. He measured their what he called their people management practices, their PMP, which is basically are you an effective leader? Are you coaching? Are you supporting? Are you, in, you know, are you are you focusing on output, not hours, all of that sort of stuff versus are you more of a bureaucrat or an autocrat or dictator, right? Tell them what to do. And then he tracked the financial performance over 10 years. And it's interesting. He he compared the, those that had the high people management practice scores with those that had low ones. And the financial returns, it was massive. Over 10 years, those with the effective leadership, thus with engaged employees, more inspired workplaces, their annual sales growth was 16.1% compared to 7.4% for those with much more bureaucratic or autocratic styles. Annual uh, profit margin was 6.4% for those with the really effective leadership versus 3.3% with more management. I see a difference between leadership and management. You manage things, you lead people. Um, the total annual return for companies with effective leadership uh, over these 10 years was 19% for those with high effective leadership. And you absolutely can measure leadership and compared to 8.8%. So the thing is autocratic and bureaucratic companies have been able to make a profit. They're just flushing half their profits down the toilet because uh, they, uh, because they simply, uh, do not understand the power of engaging your people and having them fully present. Yeah, and it's quite interesting. I think uh, you also have in the States the, the Gallup Engagement Index, which is mm -hmm. pub published every year. And in their study, uh, they once showed uh, that the engagement of employees follows the leadership. 
So if, if you have a, a, a leader of a department, he's promoted to another department or another level of the organization, then within three to four months, the, the engagement level becomes the one of the department where he's come from. So yes. they're taking their engagement level with them. So which is a clear indicator that it depends on the leadership. So if it was high before, they will be high in the new department. If it was low before, the engagement level will reduce. Absolutely. Down to that leadership level. is the key influencer for, for engagement. And you know, the other thing, this is back to the disengagement. It's kind of scary. The latest Gallup study showed that in North America, 51% of people are actively looking for other jobs. That's terrifying in my, to me, it should be terrifying to any leader. I think. Especially, especially as the, the amount of people available in the workforce or available to, to be hired is getting lower and lower because of the retirement of the baby boomers. Absolutely. And, you know, some people have said, you know, because baby boomers are workaholics and the younger generations aren't really for every person that you're losing, you're, you're only every three people you're losing, you're really only gaining one new person. And yeah. so you're not, there's not going to be enough people for everybody. And if you do not change your culture, if you do not change your leadership style, the, the, the you quality, have anyone. Let, let me be devil's advocate here. The, I think in, in baby boomers, the quality of people, the quality of the work people do, not the quality of people, but the quality of the work people do, it's much more procedural. So they are trying to follow instruction. They are trying to follow protocol, uh, getting a getting an okay from a higher level before they proceed, and so on, so on. So there's lots of activity, lots of effectiveness getting lost in in the red tape, in the bureaucracy that that especially larger corporations have built up. And and I'm I'm now having in, in fall I'm I'm accompanying a, a board of directors of a of a pretty large company to find ways how they can get decisions made faster across borders because they're, they're right. operating in several countries. And so just to get the people to have a first initial meeting takes ages because of the different uh, times and cultures and so on. So they want to find now ways how to get faster to decisions because yeah. Yeah. Their, their, their thing is they say, okay, they have the programmers waiting to actually work on a project, but they can't proceed because they didn't get the okay from the from the uh, upper level. And right. so then they, they, these programmers, they get frustrated and they lose their engagement and their zest in, in developing new stuff that actually could be potentially very, very profitable. And this is actually going to tie into the systems framework that, 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 I, that, that I'm bringing in. Instead of trying to control everything, you're just controlling the right things. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, I think it's a pullback or a hold back to the old style management where, you know, management is power. Therefore I make all the decisions and that's an absolute total right. rock. That's a, that's a way in today's fast paced society to guarantee obsolescence and obscurity for your yes. company. Yes. And in my opinion, one of the defining factors of an inspired organization is trust. Yes. Trust, trust that we have established a framework that allows us to come to a decision and that when I entrust you with a project, with a task, then you know in which framework you can act independently without needing to get back to me all the time and, and go for confirmation. <clears throat> but that also means that we accept that there will be mistakes made. Yes. Mistakes, were, mistakes were always made. Yes. So. It, just because that we try to rule them out in, in several uh, instances that we have to go through hierarchy and getting back down again, uh, and then still the mistake is made. Uh, yeah, so. Yeah, and the thing is, is it a mistake or is it a learning process? And the more mistakes right. you make, the more the better your people become because they're learning. Uh, yes. You know, the, there's, I, I think back to I, in the 90s, I did a lot of work with the military here. And the, the, we, the, we had two bases across the harbor in the city I'm in. And to get across the bridge, you needed a, a token to pay, you know, to pay the toll for the bridge. That cost 75 cents. 
Well, I sat down and I worked out all the person hours it took to get authorization for the token, how much work got held up, the 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 cost of the 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 different people involved, and it cost thirty eight dollars and forty two cents to get authorization for a seventy five cent token because some turkey one turkey years ago abused it and therefore there was all sorts of a kerfuffle so because they had no ability to really lead they only managed they wanted to control everything they put down all of these controls and they wind up costing 50 times as much every time they use it you could let 50 people abuse it and still be ahead Save but money. because they don't understand they're trying to control people and you can't control people you control the systems to keep people moving in the same direction to incentivize them the right way you can create frameworks to uh, control people if you will by very strict and rigid regulations and you might want to have strict protocols on things like uh, airplane security protocols or atomic power plants or something that yeah, really want to make sure that you double check and triple check everything that you're doing. Yes, please. But most other <laughs> things are not a po atomic power plant, are not an aer aeroplane cockpit. It's so, not rocket science. I can say that. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> so therefore, uh, I mean, okay, mm -hmm. if, if, if somebody abuses a 75 cent token, okay, do, do a cost, a cost benefit evaluation, and, and you'll see that this is clearly not the. Not, uh, not the point. Yeah. We've got a comment here coming up with uh, Rachel. She's saying that trust, especially important in sales and negotiation, to be flexible in negotiations allows the manager to accept offers without having to go to management, which causes a loss of the deal. Uh, uh, absolutely. Thoughts on that, Mark? Absolutely. No, I, t I, t I totally agree. Uh, and it's so. Of course, if somebody is coming new to, to the plate and, and starting in the process, then it, trust doesn't mean, okay, do whatever you want. No. But it means clearly establishing that we have an understanding of how we are dealing with things. And so if you're not sure, get back to me. But if you're within the procedures that we have a framework and by experience, you will gain more and more. So uh, you don't you don't start out or usually it's not advisable to start out with like trusting everything. Uh, but you start with a small thing and see how the person reacts and, and how it works out. And then by, by, by days or weeks, a month, uh, you enlarge the, the allowance, uh, the, the rain, the free rain that they have. And, and by that, then you still stay lean and have a, a sort of a gu guideline as to where you want to go or what, what is, what is appropriate. Well, I, I think that there's two types of trust. There's trusting your employee to do things and giving them, you know, breadth of span of mistakes that they they you should let them make mistakes or early on small ones that, that they can learn from, but that expands over time. But there's yeah. also trust for the employee that it's safe to take a risk, to actually take Absolutely. a chance and go beyond what is always because if you're not doing that it's it's like rachel said if you're in a sales uh scenario you're you know you lose the opportunity you've got to be able to respond and and, and know where you can take gamble say this is the best deal versus yeah. someone six levels up who may not be clear and and this is this is something that i will i will go into a little bit in in the uh in in the five steps that i'll be talking right. about the the last thing that I'd like to say maybe before we get into your five steps is there's a quote that I, I love uh, by Dennis Kinlaw, who wrote the book Coaching for Commitment. And he says, you can force people to do satisfactory work. And that's the controls. and so. But the only way for them to consistently do outstanding work, not just one off, but consistently, was for them to want to. And you cannot control them to want to. You cannot say you will want to excel. They, yeah. they've got to they've got to feel safe they've got to feel comfortable that they can and they've got to be inspired yeah. by what you're doing as an organization so that they want to do more yeah it's abs absolutely true yeah 
So with that, why don't we step into your five steps that you uh, that yes. you want to um, bring to with our pleasure. attention? With pleasure. Well, this is this is a, a program I'm doing called Moving Mountains Together, um, and it basically consists of five steps: how to create an environment where people are empowered from within, where they actually want to engage, and to really outperform and not outperform because they are forced to or they're ordered to but because they they are they are wanting to be engaged they're wanting to contribute to a bigger good and so the the this is a this is applicable on a, on a personal level on a team level for a leadership level it doesn't really matter it, it it's it's working in schools it, it's it's working in in families uh whatever it is it is five steps where you really can enhance the self-esteem of a person. And so there, there, are, there are five five levels, and the first one is a feeling of security. So if, if there needs to be a sense of security. So no matter how interesting our conversation is and, and how uh, inspiring this is, if you're not sure that the ceiling will hold up, you'll be out of here because your sense of security will say, okay, you've got to be there, not here because here is not safe. And the, the question is then, uh, how safe is your environment? And I've just recently seen a, a, an amazing uh, documentary on the after-war generation in, in public television in Germany. And, you know, the underlying uh, innuendo or, or like mentions or non-mentions of the things that happened in World War II and, the, and, and after that in, in the where the many many men were prisoners of war in either in France or in Russia or wherever, uh, the amount the amount of trauma not addressed there affected the whole of Germany. Affected, mm -hmm. I mean, the if you really did a research on how much that cost in terms of then uh, early heart attacks, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, like all the health imp imp impacts, huge. And this all goes back to a feeling of security. If I don't think that I'm safe here, and this perfectly ties into what you said in, in terms of trust and that I'm trusted to make mistakes and that there is, there is a, a common agreement that the mistakes are there to be made. Yeah? And a lot of organizations have a cover your butt mentality. Yes, of course. Yeah. And this is because there is no sense of security. Yeah. There's no, and, and the, the sense of security ultimately ties down to, is it okay to be me? Mm -hmm. Is it okay to, to bring my weaknesses also to the table? And lots of, lots of uh, organizations play sitting in the trenches. You know, like in, like in, in the First World War, they were sitting in the trenches with their, their guns sticking out and seeing, okay, where's the enemy that, that I have to defend myself to? And that's, a, that's the same, well, not with real bullets, but with emotional ones uh, that we de are dealing today in, in today's corporate environments. Yeah? So right, I, have to right. say, I have to save my butt. I have to protect my claim. I have to protect those who work with me and the others are the enemy. Of course, then there is no sense of security. Yes. And if th these five steps that, that I'm talking about in this program, they are actually building up on each other. So the next step is a sense of identity. So... How can I stand for who I am if, number one, the sense of security isn't there, right? So then, so if I can't really stand to my weaknesses, so then I will not admit my weaknesses. I'll try to hide them. That means that my, my superiors are not aware of those weaknesses, so they'll give me tasks that play exactly into that weakness, but I cannot admit it, and therefore I'll try to cover it up, and of course I mess up everything. So instead of then, if we had a had a uh, open relationship and, and and a trusting relationship where we can say, okay, well, this is my strengths, this is my weaknesses, and so on and so on, and everybody knows of each other, and then they know how to handle each other, and it all ties in, and then suddenly uh, somebody is covering the weakness of another because they know about it. But as long as we are hiding it and we have no sense of identity that I can be who I am actually and I have to try to cover up all the time, then of course uh, we don't know about it and the negative effects are obvious. Right. So, and step three is then that we have a sense of belonging. 
So I can, only if I know who I am and I can stand for what I am and what my weakness is, what my strength is and all the personality that I am, then I can decide actually who do I want to be with? Who is, the, who is my peeps, so to say? And uh, how do I want to tie in? And the funny thing is, actually, we've seen that street gangs fulfill all those five steps perfectly. So they, they give A as a security, they give B an identity. Well, it's not that you're really, really yours, but they give you an identity. Uh, by that, they create a belonging. And step four is purpose and vision. And step five is the competence. And so the purpose and vision is clear, beat up the other gang on the other block. And the competence, well, we teach you the competence. So this is street fight and a knife and, and shoot a gun and uh, get the money to, to have the guns and the knives and all that. It's the same five steps that we can use instead of for a detrimental purpose, for a positive purpose. And so if, if we can create an environment where we are actually feel a belonging, then, then I, I want to be there for my others. And then it doesn't really matter, not that we should be abusing working hours and say, okay, well, because you feel now engaged, you should be working 10 hours a day instead of like seven or eight. Uh, but you will not, you, the people will have a higher commitment if it's needed to really be there for each other. And by that then, you will have shorter, shorter uh, return cycles, you will have shorter decision cycles, uh, because people just want to be with each other and they want to be friends and they want to be a close, net, close. And many people, or I've heard many people say, well, we don't want a, we, we don't want a friendship in the working place because you don't know what happens if people gang up together. Well, but that, that's the same scarcity mentality that we, we were talking about before when there's no trust. And it's ironic people, when you spend more time with those people at work than you do with anybody else in your life. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay, we're spending like eight hours a day being afraid that somebody uncovers uh, my, my weaknesses. How, how ridiculous is that? Yeah. So, and... So if we have now those three are the basic ones that we need to get in a, in, in a personal space that we know each other, we know how to handle each other and to get along with each other. And by that we'll build friendship, we'll build, by then we can build a common purpose and a common vision and a common trust. Uh, and many organizations start there. Yeah, they, they do a mission statement, they do a company vision and they put it on the wall somewhere and people stand there in front of it. We wanna be the leading, uh, Oh God! Don't get me started on those. Yeah, it's like zoom. Yeah, and people standing there and say, "Okay, for that they were all the board was sitting for three days up in a lonely hut to do that." Yeah. And then you know, I, and we our our common values are honesty, trust, and blah blah blah. And people experience the exact opposite being practiced every day in in all of the departments. Okay. Well now. How, should that work? It, That's it, something it, like for me, this is first of all, this vision speak and mission speak. Honestly, first, it's like, you know, we strive, they're all the same. We strive to be a world class provider of insert blah, blah, blah. Service here and you, you know, it's like you, you, it's about as motivating as a root canal. Um, and uh, <laughs> it's, well, you know, it, it would be, honestly, it would be, but. The, the foundation is missing. Right, but they've got to live it. And it's got to be plain English. And and here's something like Rachel, again, jump, jumps in here, the street analogies, uh, street gang analogy is helpful. And I think that that's key piece here is that they, they don't get into all sorts of sophisticated stuff. It's plain English, what they're about. Um, another, you know, yeah. uh, and it fulfills the basic desire of their members that is to be protected, to be part of something bigger than who they are. And we have exactly the same thing in a corporate environment. Uh, right. I want to do something that really fulfills me and that drives me and that connects to my intrinsic motivation. And that intrinsic motivation is different. And uh, the what, what managers finally have to understand is not everybody strives to become a CEO even yeah. though they are all geared up that way. Somebody is happy to be the guardian of the gate or to be working in, in the warehouse. Uh, and because they find the routine there, they, it, it fits their personality structure and, and all that. And, and they have no higher ambitions. 
And that's perfectly fine. And you have yeah. to understand who your people are in order to put them at the right place. The but best, it needs to be linked to that shared yeah. purpose. Every it, person, the person that sweeps the, the halls has to understand how they're contributing to that how? purpose stated in plain English. Exactly, exactly. And that's why when you formulate a vision, uh, formulate it with an image, we, we cannot grasp those 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 things. Uh, our subconscious mind cannot tie to it. They cannot, cannot connect to it. Um, if I, I I love one of the one of the very powerful vision statements was the one of, of Bill Gates. He said he, he does he didn't say we want to be a leading provider of of office computer uh, software blah blah blah, but he said I want to have every desk in America with a PC running Microsoft Office or Windows. That's an image that you that your subconscious mind can connect to. Yeah. Yeah. So what is it? And this is this is not we want to be, but it is more directed to what do we want to provide? What do we want to achieve? What do we want to contribute? What contribute? The, what's the difference Beautiful. we want to make? Exactly. Contribution and difference. This is this is a huge word. And even if you have a boring product like I don't know, selling selling the 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 rubber uh, fuses for for oil rigs or something i don't know uh, there is something useful that you can find and this is a this ties into corporate storytelling what is the story that you tell to yourselves and then to your to your to your employees and then to your to your mem to your uh, audience out there to your to your public and not intend in the sense of making up a story but creating the narrative that really illustrates what you are all about. Right. And that and is where really vision then becomes powerful. Simple. Yeah. Exactly. And step and five the, is then, sorry. Sorry. And step five, just to quickly finish that, uh, is then the competences that we need to uh, build the vision. And the competences means that we we need actually our the managers need more to be a coach than a and a leader than a supervisor and a controller. Right, and uh, in the in that sense, it's I I always say okay, hire please for character, not for <laughs> talent. You can skills, teach anything, any skills you want. Skills can be acquired, but an asshole stays an asshole. Sorry to put it that bluntly. Yeah, I mean that's what all of the high performing organizations do. Southwest yeah. Airlines Container Store, they hire personality. They can teach you what they need. Absolutely. And with those five steps, we can develop a program to really look at what what you're doing and how you're doing that. And uh, then of course, each of the five steps has certain aspects to that to implement to look at your your pro the practical uh, situation in an organization how to do that there, there are many 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 things that are, that I can't cover here in this overview but yeah. that's the base yeah. that's the basic idea and what it leads to is that people who are in self esteem who are actually uh, living up with their full potential they're showing up fully they they are they're committed they they want to make a contribution and they are inspired and the, the only other thing i want to say before we move forward is the what you said about the values or the principles uh, oh, yeah. that uh, they need to it's it's not it shouldn't be the sort of thing that uh, people roll their eyes at it, it's got to first of all it's got to be traded translated into specific behaviors so you know you may say you believe in integrity I may say I believe in integrity but we tick each other off because the definitions we've got in our heads are different so when I'm working with an organization on that, it's it's uh, you know we 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 say okay, what are the behaviors we would see mm -hmm. that would show you're living that? So we all have an objective right. measure, and then there's got to be a culture where the you know without putting any value this not putting any value statement in, but just uh, illustrated the person who's at the bottom of the org chart can call the president CEO on on it and say you know what you when you did that I don't believe you were living the values and then you can have a conversation about that that you've got to be in that open arena where it's you know so people aren't just rolling their eyes they can say okay this is what's expected of us now we can have a conversation when we think it's not happening and as you continue that conversation they become living values and continue. right 
And, and everybody, as you say, even the president, they have to be accountable for this. Oh, let's not go there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. Sorry, uh, wrong one, president. Yeah. Well, uh, okay. Uh, one one thought about this still is when you choose your core values for your organizations, choose carefully. Yes. Because a core value, in my opinion, must be inviolable. You, it must be. There is no way that you can violate that core value, and right. that's why I would I would strongly. Uh, or I'm concerned if, if an organization has the core value honesty. Because in, in a corporate environment, and I'm not, I'm not promoting cheating or lying, but there are times and circumstances where you don't want to conceal, or uh, where you want to conceal, where you don't want to reveal everything that's going on. They are proprietary uh, know-how in the company. They are, they are some, some uh, you know, you don't, you don't want to beat somebody over the head with, with the information that they have cancer, but then we want to do it in a tactful and meaningful way. And honesty can be sometimes right. be very, very brutal. So yeah, be, be my, very, very careful when, when you choose your core values. Absolutely. And and my other concern with that is what you said is, you know, sometimes the, the you know, there's a big deal that's coming, uh, coming up and, and you, yes, this is our value, but this is really important. So we've got to do it this way. Well, no, it's no, gotta be, exactly. it uh, does. It's what you walk away from, right? That, that you're willing to walk away from that shows that you're really living it. So this comes now, uh, what I'd like to present is the systems framework that I use. And this is a framework that I got from a friend of mine who's uh, Michael Bash, who's one of the founding partners of FedEx. He's the man who created all the uh, systems that, that developed the, the legendary service FedEx had in its first couple of decades, right? It's still good, but it's not the level that it was. And the stuff I like about Mike's stuff is it's incredibly simple but it's hugely, hugely powerful. So systems, let's look at systems are the way nature works, the way the world works. Let's just look really simply. If you uh, have a piece of paper there, just draw a circle on the piece of paper, okay? And what I'd like to do is at the top, at the 12 o'clock position to write the word go. At the uh, three o'clock position on the right-hand side to write the word gap. And on the bottom, action, and on the left, feedback, okay? And this is how a system works in nature. Like our body, for example, keeps our temperature the same. It's 98.6 Fahrenheit, or is it 37 Celsius, right? Mark? 36.5. 36. 36. Okay, fine. <laughs> uh, and what happens, so that's the goal that our body has. And if we walk into a really hot room that gets really hot, that gap, all of a sudden our body heats up. So there's a gap between that. So the action our body takes is it sweats. And the feedback should be that we cool down. Now we don't do this consciously. It just happens automatically. Your unconscious mind runs that. That's a system. If you go into a cold room, your goal is still that 98.6, 36.5 body temperature. The gap now is, is negative, that's suddenly colder, right? So all of a sudden the body's getting colder and it's not at the goal. So the action your body takes is it shivers, you get goosebumps, these sorts of actions. The feedback is your internal body temperature should warm up. Again, you don't do this consciously, your body runs it. That's a system, it just runs itself, okay? So that just gives you a basic idea of a system. With organizations and people, there's a slight difference. and. Mike and I updated his systems framework a few years ago. So if you draw another circle and at the top, at the 12 o'clock position, write the letter F as in uh, Frank. Uh, at the three o'clock position, write the word E and that's gonna be for engage. At the bottom, at the six o'clock, you write the letter A and at the um, nine o'clock position on the left-hand side of the circle, uh, you write the letter T. And this is what we call the feet system, F-E-A-T, to accomplish a feat. And at the center of the system, there's more to this, is guess what, Martin? Purpose and principles. <laughs> shared purpose, shared principles, okay? But this outer side part, I've literally been able to go into an organization and double the productivity in two weeks just by tweaking this. So the top of the system 
is focus, F for focus. And what that is, is talking about focusing people so that their goals are aligned, so that they are all in the same direction. Mm -hmm. uh, and the framework that Mike has for this, that, that I love, he called it CEO goals, but CEO stands for something different. It's customer, employee, organization. And what he says is the goals have to be aligned, not the same. So, for example, the let's just you know there there's public sector, there's nonprofit, there's profit companies. This, let's just deal with a simple for-profit company. The organizational goal is profit, right? So, the so that's the 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 company goal. The or so that's the organization goal. That comes from not just satisfying. If you follow the research now, satisfaction is relevant. It's from delighting your customer, making them love do business, doing business with you. How often at those critical moments of truth, when you can do something to wow the customer or you do something amazing to solve a problem, how often is management there? Rarely, right? It's that frontline employee. So what are they motivated to do? Are they motivated to wow the customer and say, sorry, I don't have the authorization to do that. And therefore you kick off the customer. So uh, for example, I walked into a drugstore to buy an 85 cent candy bar, a pharmacy here. And the clerk made a mistake. He had to wait for the front store manager to come from somewhere else in the store and void the cash register before he could take my money now the front store manager says he's thinks he's being really smart kids lucky to have a job blah 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 but he doesn't realize he's totally demotivated me to ever go any of the other places i could go within 10 seconds walk to buy uh anything in the future and and in business it's the repeat purchases that drive profitability that that employee is not even motivated to apologize to me or to look at me he's looking up at the whatever he's totally turned me off so you know how can you engage your employee or focus your employees so that they're wowing that customer all right so that's the f the focus the e on the right hand side is for engage and what that's about is is the gap you know, the gap in the previous example is the body temperature, but there's the gap between where you want to be in your goals and where you are relevant to the employee. So do they care? Is there a win for doing that or is there a penalty for not doing it? You know, it's back to carrot or stick, right? So, <clears throat> you know, there are call centers that, that, that say, we will measure your, uh, we will be listening to the recording to track quality, right? You hear that? And they have checklists of so many things that the, the callers have to do. I, I went into one call center and they knew what they had to do, but you know what? They had to make money. So they were just pushing through and they were getting like 40, 50% quality ratings. And so the, it wasn't a matter of knowing, they knew it. So I made one simple change. I multiplied the salary for the week by the average quality rating. All of a sudden it went from 40, 50% to 98, 99% quality because it became relevant. You know, you engage. So now they have a win. The feedback, the F at the um, nine o'clock on the left-hand side is feedback. And it doesn't matter what your job is, how can you simplify what you do uh, to three to five things you keep on track. It's a 2080 rule. You keep those three to five things on track, you will be successful. You, you could measure a thousand things, but it's not going to be relevant, right? So how can you distill that down? And then how can you measure it daily? Simple frameworks for measuring it daily, right? And um, the, for example, I said the delighting a customer uh, you know, a framework we've used is we've done, you can do this electronically. I've seen it in a lot of organizations now, but we've also done it physically that at the door to a store, when people leave, there are five tubes with a slot in each. And then when they finish their service encounter, they're given a poker chip on one end of the, the slots of the tubes is a frowny face on the other end is a happy face and they drop that poker chip in the slot that describes how they felt about that service encounter so the one thing that's going to define repurchase so you have a daily measure of how it's done
Now, I've seen that sort of thing happening in a lot of bathrooms in airports, and I'm sorry you need to think this through. I am not going to touch any button in the bathroom. Uh, it's a great system, but you got to find another way to do it. Okay. I wonder why. <laughs> so <laughs> the thing is focus, engage, and, and, and track the feedback. Um, the bottom of that is action. And that's the one we stay away from, but that's where most people go. That's where people write policy manuals. And the more you, you try to control people, the more they're going to slip through your fingers and you're going to grow inefficiencies. And, and I realize people work in bureaucratic organizations, but the more you can avoid going to action, and the more you can align the goals, engage them by making the gap relevant, and track the right thing so that they know now to take the right action, the more you free them up to do what it takes to move the organization in the right direction. So that's the uh, the basic systems framework that I use when I go into mm -hmm. an organization. Any thoughts, Martin? Oh, it sounds great. It sounds really relevant. It sounds very applicable. So, and, and I'd like, do you, do you have this chart somewhere? I mean, I'd really Absolutely like to see do. I, I can stick it into the comments uh, in, uh, on, this, uh, on this video so that yeah. I, uh, I've got a white paper on it that I can put in there. Fantastic. So I think it's, this is really relevant and really valuable. And I think I also have a, a, a report on those five steps that I can also provide. So then maybe we can put it up in the in the comment sections or something. Yeah, we can put that in the comments. So if want, people want to yeah. access them, they can get get them there. Yeah, absolutely. Now, it's very, very interesting. I'd, I'd, I'd like to read some some more about this because I think this is really, really also relevant and, and uh, very clear to implement. Yes. It's great stuff. So uh, let me ask if there are any uh, questions, comments from the people listening in here as, as we go forward here, just that, that we can answer. And if you do, just type them into the comments so that we can see them. Uh, just while we're waiting, you can find out uh, more about Martin um, at, uh, at his website uh, that's the scrolling across there. And... Um, of course, through, if you're watching this on Facebook, you can track us down there through through the video. And um, if you'd like to find out more about the corporate work that that I do, then you can also access me at uh, my website. Uh, and we've both got our. Uh, of course, they're built on our names, so they're very easy to find. So any comments or thoughts you have, Martin, to wrap things up as we go? I think we, I mean, it's great stuff. And I think we we both only touched the tip of the very iceberg. So it's absolutely so, so, so much more to it. And uh, But I think these both are, are very relevant approaches, how to get, how to turn an organization around and make them make them more relevant for the employees and for the customers. Because... Uh, when everybody says it's all about the happy customer, um, yeah, uh, no, but I'd no. say a happy employee will create a happy customer. Well, so that's that's uh, that's the that's the conduit that we have to take uh, because if, if we don't have inspired inspired employees, we'll not have happy customers. Well, let's. Uh, there's a uh, great book by Hal Rosenbluth called "The Customer Comes Second. And it's exactly that. It is about, yeah. um, it, he says, if your uh, customer, uh, if your employee doesn't know how it feels like to be treated like gold, how the heck are they going to treat the customer that way? And as a manager, your customers uh, are your people, are your employees, and you've exactly. got to wow them so that they can deliver that same level of service. Yeah, totally agree. Well, thank you all. Thank you, uh, Martin. This, is, this has been a delight as usual. And we will be back, uh, I believe it's next week, next Thursday, uh, for um, what was the topic? I'm just, to, oh, oh, 
uh, we did a show last week on, you know, does the uh, the law of attraction actually work? And so yes. this was a follow up to that. Okay, how do you actually live this in reality? Because a lot of people explore it, but uh, get mixed results. So that's what we're going to be. How do you live intentionally and and create the results that you want in work and in the rest of your life? Exactly. And I'm looking very much forward to this. This will be fun. That will be indeed. All right. We will see you soon.